the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, <clears throat> keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had, ser had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Now, at the risk of embarrassing Raydell, I want to say that I love when Raydell Marks reads the scripture. And someday, I want Raydell to record the entire scripture on, on audio recording so that I can just play it whenever I want. Um, so if you ever want to get me a Christmas gift, friends, you just get together with Raydell and uh, make it happen. But I often remark to Michelle uh, about that. It's just kind of, kind of funny. So my apologies, Raydell, if I've embarrassed you. But I do enjoy when you read the scripture for us. Um, after all of that, it's time for us to take a closer look at the scripture that was read for us. And as we've been uh, here in this Advent season and these days leading up to Christmas, we've been focusing on this Christmas for the Broken series. And we've been looking at the brokenness that exists in these perhaps familiar Christmas stories, but brokenness that speaks to the brokenness we face in our own lives as well. That the brokenness we read about in the story of Jesus' birth speaks to the, the brokenness in, in our story. And some of us, as we've lived our lives, have encountered great brokenness, but all of us have experienced brokenness of some sort along the way. And so as we've been journeying through these passages, we looked first in the very first week in Advent, uh, beginning of the month, we, we looked at the Luke 1 passage that, that describes the genealogy of Jesus. Actually, it was the uh, Matthew 1 passage where it talks about the genealogy of Jesus. We talked about how God uses broken people to do a work of redemption in this world. We talked about all the imperfect people God used along the way. We talked about all the issues that those people had uh, that God used to bring about the birth of his son. We talked about how God God used unlikely people to, uh, to introduce Jesus into the world at some point. We talked then about Joseph, uh, Jesus' earthly father, and how he was dealing with this uncertainty and, and how we deal with uncertainty in our own lives. We deal with it in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's the uncertainty of, of what's even around the corner, maybe even the next day. But uh, we talked about how obedience is, is vital as we live our lives for God, that though we don't know what's around the corner, we can live our lives in obedience to him by simply taking the next step and doing the next thing. 
We talked about Mary, the mother of Jesus, last week. We talked about how she was under a tremendous pressure once the angel told her that she was going to give birth to God's son. We, we talked about how, how for any of us that would be a scary news and how for her that turned her life upside down. She was a young teenage woman and her life would never ever be the same. We talked about how one of the best things we can do in our lives when the pressure is on is for us to praise God in those moments and really trust him, to lean into him. And this morning is no different as we encounter another kind of brokenness that we face. And as we talk about brokenness this week, we're we're not talking about um, like the main characters of uh, the Christmas story, like thinking Joseph or Mary or even baby Jesus. We're talking about the shepherds. The shepherds speak to a very um, personal kind of brokenness that we face, and maybe for us, a very painful brokenness that we face. It's the brokenness of feeling like an outsider. And maybe for you, as you think about your life, maybe in the past or maybe in the present, you've dealt with some of the brokenness that comes from being an outsider, being that person that's on the outside looking in. Maybe for you that brokenness was, uh, was long in the past. Maybe for you the brokenness of feeling like an outsider was, was in school. Uh, when the teams would get picked for um, like gym class and you were the last person that was picked. Um, that is, friends, the Adam Roberts story. I know you're surprised because I am like the picture of uh, health and manliness, but um, uh, yes, yes, that was Adam Roberts, the last kid picked. And if you were the first kid picked, can, can we just say, us last kids that got picked, we hate you, um, and we're working on trying to love you. Um, but let, we, if we can't be honest in church, where can we be honest, really? Um, but that's painful for those people who were picked last. It's that feeling of, of feeling like an outsider. Or maybe for you, you just never had the opportunity to sit at the cool kids' table in school. And, and like, if we're being honest, like, can we just say, like, there's still a cool kids' table even as adults? And uh, sometimes even as adults, we feel like we're, like, are we ever going to be at the cool kids' table? And uh, maybe the answer is no. But you've dealt with that kind of brokenness. Maybe for you, uh, you feel like an outsider where you work just because you're not in the inner circle and maybe you're not part of those uh, what seem to be fun conversations around the water cooler or maybe you're not in the, in the inside circle, you're not privy to all the other information that everyone else has at work or, or maybe you just feel like an outsider in your family. Maybe because of your faith in Jesus, it's left you sort of uh, on the fringes of family life. Or, or maybe you feel like an outsider just in society in general, uh, that, that maybe for whatever reason, you just don't feel like you're part of the crowd. And, and can we just acknowledge that, that for those of us who've ever felt that way, it is very personal and it is very painful. Like no one wants to feel uh, unwanted. No one really wants to feel misunderstood. No one really wants to feel all that awkward. And yet we do at various times. And there's good news for us in this passage. It's another reminder that Christmas is for the broken, people like you and people like me. So this morning, we're gonna take a look at the shepherds. And and really, as we take a look at their story, the application is twofold because there's good news for for those who feel like outsiders, but then there's also good news for those who are outsiders and who've become insiders. And that's what we're gonna talk about in detail this morning. It's a a twofold kind of a message and a twofold kind of an application as we take a closer look at the Christmas story. So if you would, would you join me in uh, verse eight of the passage that was read for us? I promise that if you come back for our Christmas Eve services uh, tomorrow night at four or six, we'll handle the rest of the passage. But this morning, uh, we're gonna zero in on what's happening with the shepherds. And so in verse eight, here's what it says. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. There's a little word buried in that sentence that's very, very important for us to understand understand a little bit about what the shepherds were up against. They were out in the fields nearby. They were not just out outside, but they were out of the city. They were out from among the people. They were kept on the fringes of society for various reasons. They were outsiders in many ways. And yet, they were the very first people to hear the good news of the birth of Jesus. But shepherds in those days would be the most unlikely people to get the very first announcement of the birth of Jesus. Shepherds were the lowest of low on the social ladder. 
Shepherds were the lowest of the low on the economic ladder. Shepherds were, um, like, if you had a kid and you were raising little Johnny and you asked little Johnny, Johnny, what do you want to be when you grow up someday? If they said shepherd, like, you would just be horrified that they would say such a thing. The last thing you would want your son to grow up to be would be a shepherd. Because shepherds, they were just not respected at all. That was, that was just uh, work for um, just the, the kind of like the, the lowest of the low socially. And uh, you weren't going to make a good living if, if you were a shepherd. Um, shepherds were looked at as uh, not just social outsiders, but they were looked at as religious outsiders too. And, and even in the, the day-to-day uh, events of, of life in, in uh, this particular time, in this particular place, um, shepherds were trusted very little. They were trusted so little that in a courtroom, a shepherd's testimony would not be accepted. Shepherds were so disrespected and so disregarded that uh, most shepherds were considered to be on par with con men. And so they're, they're not the most likely people to receive this special news, and yet that's what makes it so remarkably, m- remarkable because it says there that, that an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. It, it, I find it really interesting that, that we get this vivid description of what happens, that the shepherds don't just get an angelic announcement. Like they get an, an angelic announcement where, where um, the, the, the angels pull out all the stops. Like the glory of the Lord shows around the angel. Uh, they, they, they get a, a bunch of angels that come to them. It's a really, really, really significant announcement that these guys get. And for any of us who would get an angelic announcement like they were terrified, and wouldn't you be terrified if someday an angel appeared to you? You'd be really terrified if a whole group of angels appeared to you with this bright light, and uh, it, it would be pretty intense, and yet that's what happens. But the angels speak these words, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people today. In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, or he is Christ, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Notice, notice that this good news was good news not just for the the rich, not just for the powerful, but this was good news for people even like the shepherds. It's good news that will cause great joy for all the people, the haves and the have-nots the social insiders as well as the social outsiders. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And he is Christ or the Messiah. He's the Lord. He's the one sent to save. Again, there's only one angelic announcement that's given to announce the birth of Jesus after it's happened. And the one invitation goes to a group of social and religious outcasts. Of all the people God, of, God could have sent angels to, he sends them to outsiders. Why would God choose outsiders like the shepherds to announce the birth of his son? It's this, because Jesus arrived for all people. People like you, people like me, people with issues, people who aren't perfect, people who have problems, people who don't have it all together, people who mess up again and again, uh, people who are outsiders, people who are broken. Christmas is for the broken and it's good news for all of us. And so again, if you've ever felt like an outsider uh, socially, um, it is good news when you take a look at God's heart as it's seen in the passage. And then there's something that emerges here, uh, a truth that I think affects the way we live our lives, that God actually has a heart for outsiders. And so as you and I deal with those situations in our lives as outsiders, when we feel like we're on the outside looking in, just like we've been assured in every section or every story in the series so far, you know, God sees that, God cares about that, and God is with us in that, that there's no never a time when we're alone. Well, it may seem like we're outsiders among people. If our hope is in Jesus, as far as God is concerned, we are always, always insiders. God has a heart for outsiders. And it's really important, I think, um, for us to, to see that not just socially, 
but it, for us to see that as far as our relationship with God is concerned. So the good news of Jesus' birth, it, it gets announced first among shepherds, among outsiders. But it reminds us that, that every one of us in this room has come into this world as an outsider, that we are born into this world as, at, at odds with God. We are born into this world as, as enemies with God. Uh, we are born into this world tainted with sin. We are broken, messed up people who have no power in and of ourselves to fix ourselves. That the, the scriptures say that the price of our sin or our rebellion is death. But God has made a way through the birth of his son for us to become insiders. And there's really only one way for us to become insiders with God. It's to put our hope in Jesus, the one God sent to live a perfect life, the one God sent to die the death that every one of us deserves, to, to trust Jesus and Jesus alone. It's interesting, yesterday I, I was talking to somebody um, from church and, and we were talking about how, how easy it, it may be for, for people to be part of a church for years and years and years, to hear the story of Jesus told again and again and again, to hear the good news of the gospel message shared again and again and again, and never really come to understand personally what that means. To, to be an insider as far as like proximity to the church is concerned, like to be inside the doors but to be an outsider because they've never put their faith and trust in Jesus. And maybe for you, that was part of your story in how you became an insider. Maybe for you, you were a religious insider, but you never really had experienced what it means to be an outsider in your relationship, or an insider in your relationship with God. And maybe for you, uh, you came to know Jesus in a, in a personal way. Maybe for you, you lived in this day, or there was a time in your life where uh, you believed that following Jesus was about Jesus, but it was about Jesus and trying to be a better person, or Jesus and uh, going through some sort of religious ritual, maybe Jesus and your confirmation, or Jesus and your church membership, or Jesus and your uh, baptism as a baby, something like that. And God opened your eyes to the good news of Jesus. See, we can live our lives as uh, religious outsiders, even all the while being inside of a church building. But we can also be outside simply by thinking that somehow, some way, the lives we live, the places we've been, the, maybe the place we are, somehow puts us off limits of experiencing God's love and God's grace as he expresses it through Jesus. And what I want to say today is this, God has a heart for outsiders. God wants to see you become an insider. God wants to see you see how much you need to put your hope in Jesus. God wants you to know that when he announced that, that this Savior has been born, the Savior has been born to you and for you as well, that Jesus can be Lord of your life, that you don't need to wander where you stand with God, that as you put your hope in Jesus and in Jesus alone, you can experience it's new life. And if you're here today and you've never come to the place where, where you've seen the depth of your sin and you've wrestled with how broken you are, if you've never come to the place where you, you, you cried out to Jesus and believed on him as, as Savior and Lord of your life, the scriptures would say you're still an outsider. You, you haven't entered into this relationship with God. But you can as you admit your sin, as you believe on Jesus, as you confess him as Lord. That's the good news we see in the passage. And so th there's, there's the part of the passage where God's heart is for outsiders, but then there's this, this shift that takes place in the lives of the shepherds. And, and you can almost see it happening, can't you? Like the shepherds, they hear this good news about Jesus. They go and they see for themselves who Jesus is. They go and they experience uh, Jesus themselves. And then their lives aren't really the same. They go back to the place where they came from and they're living their lives in a much different way. And so what we'll see in the second part of the passage is that God actually, <laughs> that was the first part, God sends us to proclaim the good news of Jesus. That God actually has a purpose for our lives. It's not just that, that outsiders uh, become insiders as they put their hope in Jesus, but it's also that as we experience Jesus in our lives, God calls us then to express this faith, express this new life to the people still on the outside. That's exactly what happens in verse 17. So if you go down to verse 17, here's what it says. It says, when they had seen him, that is Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The shepherds spread 
the word. These people who were once outcasts, these people who were once outsiders, all of a sudden uh, were empowered and were pretty passionate about spreading the word about what they had experienced. And not just what they had experienced, they spread the word concerning uh, who they had experienced. They told everyone they met what they had uh, seen. They told everyone they met what they heard. They spread the word. There's a transformation that took place. They understood that, that people who had experienced something as great as the, 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 the birth of God's son Jesus himself, that that message couldn't be kept just for them. There were still outsiders who needed to become insiders. It's interesting, isn't it? That for those of us who followed Jesus for any length of time, it's easy for us to remember what it was once like to be an outsider as far as Jesus is concerned. I would imagine, let me talk to the people who would profess to be followers of Jesus in this room. Um, those of you who came to follow Jesus a little later in life, who were you? Raise your hand. I'm wondering, let me just talk to you specifically for, for a, a minute or two. Um, can you remember what life was like before you put your hope in Jesus. Do you remember what it was like to be an outsider? Do you remember what it was like to, 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 to wonder if you indeed uh, were in a right relationship with God? Do you remember what it was like to live in the hopelessness that you felt or the nagging emptiness inside of you? Do you remember now, how many of you who profess to be followers of Jesus kind of um, don't really remember what life was like before you came to follow Jesus because it happened in your life at a younger age? Okay, so there's a few of us in this room, right? You're nervous to raise your hand, I get it. Um, but there are a few of us uh, in, in this room who, who that is our story. And yet, um, one of the things that, that I think might be helpful is to remember what our lives could have been like had God not intervened, had, had God not opened our eyes to the gospel message at a young age, who we could have become. It's the time of year where, um, Peter will appreciate this, it's the time of year when I like to watch It's a Wonderful Life. It's a really good movie, and uh, it's like a Christmas Eve tradition in, in our house. And, and the thing that's gripping about about um, that story, besides the ending that always, you know, leaves even the hardiest of uh, souls weepy uh, uh, and uh, in a puddle of tears. Um, the thing that's most gripping is, is the whole story of George Bailey uh, and the story of the world around him had he never been born. And I'm wondering if, if for those of us who came to know Jesus at a young age can just imagine what it would have been like for us or imagine what it would be like for us had we never been born again, had we never experienced this, this changed life um, from an early age. It's easy for us, no matter if we came to know Jesus later or we came to know Jesus earlier, it's easy for us to forget what it's like to be an outsider to the point that we tend to fill our lives with insiders and we tend to live our lives as insiders, and it's easy for us to forget that just like the shepherds had experienced the power of Jesus and then expressed that power of Jesus, so it is our role, so it is our mission, so we are sent as well. That the God we serve is ascending God. That God sent Jesus into this world to redeem mankind. God sends the, the Holy Spirit uh, to, to sanctify those who've been found. He sends us into the world then to spread the good news of what we've seen and heard and experienced about Jesus ourselves. What would it look like for you and me to live our lives then as we're sent back out to outsiders as insiders? And really the question for us is, is how can I better live my life then as a sent one, as one who is sent by God with this uh, specific mission do you know that, that while most Christians would agree that we're called to live out this mission and most Christians would agree that the, the Great Commission is still in effect very much in 2018, that most studies, that most studies show that only 2% of Christians uh, share their faith in any sort of meaningful or real way, that most Christians in 2018 by most standards don't really live as sent ones. And it makes a lot of sense even as you look at our lives. Our lives tend to be... Um, centered around living as insiders. And, and 
in addition to remembering what it was like to live as an outsider and remembering what it must be like for outsiders to live as outsiders even at this very moment, something else that might be helpful to us in modeling uh, what the shepherds did would be for us to uh, just ask that very simple question, how can I better live as a sent one? How can I live my life as a follower of Jesus with the level of intentionality, gospel intentionality that the shepherds modeled? Um, the shepherds, as they came to know Jesus, they, they didn't instantly you know, become, um, I don't know, these, these, these missionaries of sorts. It, it, it doesn't say that they sold all their flocks and all of a sudden they, they, just, they just became um, full-time itinerant evangelists. No, uh, they went back to the people that they had come from and they spread the good news that they had experienced. And the same is true of you and me. As, as we come to know Jesus, we go back into those same circles that we had come from and we proclaim the good news of Jesus. One of the, the aspects of, of God that I always find very comforting is that, that God is um, in control of the details of our lives, that, that God uh, has us where we are for a reason. And as we think about that, that truth about God in the context of the good news of Jesus, as we think about that truth of God in the context of our mission as followers of Jesus, it's a reminder that you and I are where we are for a reason, and it's to make Jesus known in all those different circles. And that doesn't mean that, that we, uh, I don't know, pull out a soapbox and we go stand on the corner of, of Main Street in Kutztown and we just yell at people as they, they pass in the street and, and tell them that they're on their way to hell. That, that's probably not... Um, the ideal way to communicate the message of Jesus. I mean, I guess if that's your way, um, I just, I just, it's just probably not, never a good idea. Um, it might not even j- j- to be um, that, that we uh, just take some time and we're gonna just go and we're gonna hand out gospel tracts. I mean, that is a way and that may be effective. But perhaps the most effective way is the way that's been uh, shared with us over and over again uh, in the New Testament. It's simply to uh, live our lives with this gospel intentionality, to look for opportunities that God has given us, to sow gospel seeds all along the way, and when God is working, to join him in those opportunities that God gives. That that living our lives as sent ones is not something extra that we do. It's something that, 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 that we do kind of as a rule. It's something that we do in every piece of our lives. And so when we think about the fact that we are where we are for a reason, it's to, and it's to, to point people to Jesus, you, you apply that then to these various aspects of our lives. Like for those of you who are in the working world, you have the job you have for a reason. And you are in that job to, to be a, a light to people, to point people to Jesus. And so the question for anyone who has a job is, as a Christian, how do I carry out the responsibilities of my job with, with gospel intentionality? How do I carry out these various aspects of my job that actually point people to Jesus? Now, for those of you who know me, you know that, that I have been a big fan of The Office, which kind of went off the air on TV. Some of you are looking like you have no idea what that is. So, um, you just have to Google it, I guess. Um, but anyway, The Office, uh, it's about a workplace, and in The Office, there is a Christian who works there, and her name is Office Fans. Angela, there's like three of us in this room. Um, Angela works in the office. And Angela is like the token Christian that's hard to deal with. She's the token Christian who um, is judgmental of everyone around her. And she is the token Christian who um, is all about telling everybody how Christian she is, but does not live at all in a very Christian way. And uh, so when we talk about uh, being at work and, and uh, being a light for Jesus, it is best not to be Angela at work. It is best to be normal at work. Sometimes I think it's important for us as, as Christians, like, um, like don't be creepy as you live your life for Jesus at work. Um, don't be weird as you live your life for Jesus at work. Don't be overbearing uh, as you live your life for Jesus at work. Be consistent, be faithful, but also be a witness. Don't blend into everyone else. Uh, spread the good news concerning what you have seen and experienced about Jesus, but do it in a way that is, is normal and where you're sensitive to how the Spirit of God is working, not just in your heart, but in the hearts of those around you. And then have the courage to speak when God gives you the opportunity to sow those gospel seeds all along the way, to build your credibility as a follower 
of Jesus. So that's what it looks like to live for Jesus in the workplace so, so that um, as, who, I'll pick on Margie, as Margie interacts with students in, in, in her school uh, when, when they, they come in for that much needed medical care during, during school hours, uh, Margie can uh, be a light through uh, her compassion and she can be a light through those simple opportunities that God gives her. For, for those of you who, who are at work over at, at DECA and working on a line or, or doing something like that, there, is, there are things you can do as a Christian uh, as you do your job in the daily grind to, to show the world that you are a follower of Jesus in such a way that they'll want what you have. Perhaps not by preaching to all your co-workers, telling them that they're all going to hell or something crazy like that, but simply by spreading the good news that you've experienced your, yourself. Do you see what I'm saying? The same, hap- the same is true for those who are still in school. There's ways to, to live gospel intentionality there. For those of you who have family and friends, I would imagine that you at least have some of one or the other, or maybe some of both, family and friends, or family or friends. Um, uh, what can you do among your families? What can you do among your social circles to live with gospel intentionality? The, 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 the harsh reality is this. Some of you, as you gather over the next few days with, with friends and family, will be gathering with people who are still very much outsiders as far as faith in Jesus is concerned. And what will you do as an insider to sow those gospel seeds? What will you do as an insider to demonstrate some gospel intentionality to, to, to be the good news among those family members? To be the good news among those friends of yours that still seem far off? And I, and I guess I should say this, if you are gathering with people this holiday season who are friends or family members and they all share the same values as you and they're all uh, insiders as far as Jesus is concerned, you need to reach outside your circle. You need some new friends. Sooner than later. Because we can't live this truth out if we're just stuck around insiders. But the question for all of us as we consider living our lives as as sent ones, as we consider uh, being outsiders who've now become insiders and taking this message uh, to outsiders, the question is, well, will the good news of Jesus, will it stop with me or will the good news of Jesus continue through me? And isn't that an important question? Because if left to ourselves, we just might become a dead end as far as the gospel message is concerned. Like we've experienced the power of Jesus in our own lives. We've been changed as we put our hope in Jesus and we say, praise God. But if the gospel does not continue through us to other people, the gospel has reached a dead end. Now you can praise God and I can praise God that the gospel was not a dead end in the person who shared that message with you. And how awesome would it be for us to be that person? for someone else. So it, I think this passage behooves us to live with gospel intentionality. I think for any of us who've experienced this power, and this life change, we don't, we don't want the gospel to end with us. We want the gospel to continue through us. So how can we better live out our mission? Maybe for you, it, it starts in your home. Uh, maybe for you, it starts in your, your, your social circles and, and simply uh, just living a little more intentionally as a follower of Jesus. Maybe your friends and family members don't even know that you're a follower of Jesus. Or maybe as a follower of Jesus, you're the kind of follower of Jesus that no one else wants to be. Because that happens too. And that's the hard truth, because sometimes I'm that person, and let's be honest enough to say, sometimes you're that person too. And yet we have this mission So what would it look like for us to open our lives up? Maybe for you, the call is simply to to reach beyond those circles of insiders that you are surrounded by. Maybe God is calling you to go outside your circle. Maybe God's calling you to go outside your circle to, if you're in school, the kids who aren't sitting at the table that you're at. We had an interesting interaction in our house this week. We have a fourth grader who's starting to understand social situations. I'm 38, I still don't understand social situations in some cases, but um, starting to understand that there are insiders and there are outsiders and helping our child to see that it's important even at times to stand out and go to outsiders. Sometimes it's a hard lesson for us as adults. Maybe there's some outsiders that God is calling you to. Maybe it's people 
you work with that are kind of on the fringes. Maybe, maybe God is calling you to, to go to some place where no one wants to go. I was just talking to someone yesterday that they, they feel called to, to uh, start doing some ministry in, in the local prison. I mean, that's a noble work. It's an important work. That's a place where no one wants to go, where very few people want to go. Maybe it's visitation in a local nursing home. Maybe it's, it's well, you, you, you decide what that is that God might be calling you to do. But the other way we can live this out is simply by being the good news to other people. It's simply by uh, sharing this new life that we have in and through Jesus. And during the Christmas season, we probably have more of an opportunity than at any other time of the year. And I realize that um, the hours are quickly passing on the time left that we have in the Christmas season. Like by the end of tomorrow, no, sorry. I never know what day, Christ, Christmas Eve is on Monday. By the end of Tuesday, like it's, it's for a lot of us, it's over. And it, in just days, we will be packing the Christmas decorations away for 11 more months and uh, it will be over. But the season that we're in is a season where, where God is, is working and there are a lot of hurting people longing for something more than they're experiencing. There are people searching to reclaim some magic and the magic that's offered at Christmas time isn't uh, from these sentimental types of feelings. The real magic at Christmas time is, is what we experience as we embrace Jesus. So we put our hope in Jesus and Jesus alone and we're able to actually have an impact on people around us at, at Christmas time or people seem maybe a little more receptive. It's said that at, at, during the Christmas season, more than four out of 10 Americans are likely to be receptive to an invitation uh, during that season, an invitation to church. Four out of 10 or more than four out of 10. So we'll say 41% of people. And I didn't realize that 72% of statistics are made up on the spot, but But really, 41% is pretty compelling when you think about people's receptivity. What would it look like for you and me to, to, to just do a simple invite? I know that some people, when we talk about sharing the message of Jesus, you freeze up and you think, God, don't ever ask me to do that. I can't handle it. And, and so if you do the inviting, you invite them to the Christmas Eve service, you, you share the Grace Church um, Christmas Eve event on uh, your Facebook profile, you do, you do that part and I'll share the gospel message in every one of those services. We'll share the hope of salvation here. And, and you just do the part of inviting. I mean, there's, it's a simp these are simple ways. The best thing we can do is to pray for those opportunities. The best thing we can do is ask God to help us to see those opportunities. The best thing we can do is have the courage to, 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 to join God in those opportunities. But the question here, as we think about the shepherds, as we think about their own brokenness, and as we think about them then becoming the answer or the conduit through which people can experience the answer to brokenness, it really deserves a question. So if Jesus is the hope of the world, if the one born in the manger is uh, Christ, the, the Messiah, the one sent from God, the Lord of, of, of all, that it really is who Jesus is. And our call then is to point people to the only hope that can be found in him. Should we not do all that we can to live as people who've been called to point people to him. Like, shouldn't we do everything we can to make sure that outsiders around us have the opportunity to be insiders? And I think any Christian with a pulse, any Christian with any sense at all would say, yes, we should. And so what would it look like for you and me to do that? Where is God calling you and me to go? If you received the best news that's ever been given in all the world, who would you tell? What if it was your birthday? What if you won a million dollars? What if you got an awesome new toy? What if you got a perfect report card? Who would you tell? Who would you tell? Who would you tell? Who would you tell? Would you tell your family? Would you tell your friends? Would you tell everybody? Who would you tell? What would you say? Guess what? You've got to hear this. This is awesome. Would you tell them all about it? Would you leave anything out? Would they see your excitement? Who would you tell? What if God gave us his son? To love us. To forgive us. To die for us. To be punished for us. Instead of us. To save us. The greatest gift ever. Who would you tell? Who would you tell? Who would you tell? 
Who would you tell? Would you tell your family? Would you tell your friends? Would you tell everybody? Who would you tell? What would you say? Guess what? You've got to hear this. This is awesome. Would you tell them all about it? Would you leave anything out? Would they see your excitement? Who would you tell? That really is the question for all of us then. So who would you tell? And maybe the better question is who will you and I tell this Christmas season and in the days ahead? Um, God has a heart for outsiders. Do you and I as insiders have a heart for outsiders? And are you and I prepared to live as people who are sent? Let's pray. Uh, God, as we've come to your word, we are humbled, um, we're thankful, for, the, for those who are here, those of us who've experienced the power of the gospel, the awesomeness of the, the good news, um, we are grateful. And uh, Lord, we live our lives out of gratitude to you day in and day out um, because you've opened our eyes to the gospel message. You've enabled us to pass from darkness to light, from death to life. You've given us hope for this life. You've given us hope for the life to come. You've assured us of your power and your presence. And uh, Lord, our prayer today for those of us who've become insiders is that you'd help us to remember what it was like to be outsiders. Lord, that you'd help us to, to um, have a heart, the same kind of heart for outsiders that you do. Pray, Lord, that uh, even now you'd bring to mind people around us who are hurting, people around us who are wrestling with brokenness, people around us um, who desperately need to experience what we've experienced through our faith in Jesus alone. Lord, we pray today for opportunities to uh, express that hope that we have. We pray, Lord, for opportunities where we go to school or where we go to work, among the people we live with or live in close proximity to. We pray, Lord, that you'd make those opportunities very uh, real to us and very obvious to us. And Lord, give us the courage we need to allow you to work through us. Lord, help us not to manufacture opportunities, but Lord, help us to trust you, your spirit within us. Um, and may we see you, Lord, do a work in people's lives as you draw men and women and boys and girls to your son. And pray, Lord, that um, you would uh, remind us daily of this call you've placed in our lives. Lord, for those of us who've experienced this hope we have in Jesus, Lord, we confess there are those times where we still feel like outsiders. And Lord, I pray for those today who are dealing with the brokenness of just feeling like an outsider in general. Pray for those who are here who, who, who feel like they're on the outside looking in, uh, maybe uh, in the, the day-to-day, maybe where they go to work or school, maybe among their family members, maybe even here. Lord, I pray that uh, for those who know Jesus, Lord, that they'd, uh, just be reminded of your love for them, that you see, you care, you're with them, and you're empowering them. Lord, I pray for those who are here today who, who might be outsiders as far as you're concerned, as far as a relationship with you is concerned. People, Lord, who, who may be uh, trusting in being good enough or religious enough, but Lord, people who need to trust Jesus and Jesus alone. I pray, Lord, that you'd open their eyes to the good news of the gospel pray that they'd hear your voice calling them to yourself. I pray, Lord, that they'd, as they see their hopelessness, that they'd embrace Jesus, that they'd believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives, that they confess Jesus as Lord. Lord, thank you that, that as we confess Jesus as Lord, we are assured that we can know that we are in relationship with you. We can know that, that, that uh, we have passed from darkness to light, that we have passed from death to life. Lord, we can know this. We are assured of this. And we praise you for it. Lord, help us, every one of us, every one of us who's experienced the, the good news. Lord, help us today, help us in the days ahead to be the good news as you do your work through us. We pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.